Nearly after a week of uh, in custody of Morudi Bandics, 344 male students of the government science and secondary school in Kankara, Katsina State, Nigeria, Northwest, were yesterday released by their captors. Too much relief, I should say. The Katsina State government confirmed their release, saying they have been returned to the state from Zamfara, where they were held in captivity. President Mohamed Buhari has also commended the state government and the military for a job well done. According to the reports, students may be presented today to the president, who is currently in Daura, his hometown, on a week-long private visit to the state. Their release came on a day protesters matched in Abuja and Katsina against the worsening insecurity in the north, especially the abduction of the schoolboys. For an update on this developing story, we're now being joined in Katsina by Arise correspondent Amaka Okoye. Amaka, it's a pleasure uh, having you this morning, you've been doing a marvelous, I should say, job. And thank you so much for your forthrightness yesterday by standing by the story where you broke it around 2 o'clock that the boys indeed have been freed. Amaka, any updates this morning, if you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you, absolutely. Uh, yes, we do have a bit of updates. Earlier on when I spoke to, uh, gave updates on the world, uh, we mentioned that the students are not yet here. We didn't leave the government house. In fact, we just had to quickly rush back and then uh, freshen up and come back here again. So, but we didn't, they are not yet here. Uh, at some point last or early hours of today by 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. So we heard siren and thought, oh, they are here. And we all came out, you know, started fixing up our gadgets and all of that. But it turned out that they were just local uh, uh, patrol men uh, moving around. Uh, but again, the, new, the newest bit of information I have, which was not what we knew as at two hours ago, is that uh, the essay to the governor of Zampara State uh, has said that the, the students are still in Zampara State. We, we thought actually that they had left and that they are on their way here uh, where they will be received by uh, Governor Bello Masari. But what we do know currently is that they are still in Zampara and that they started some medical examination already last night and they don't know when they are going to leave, uh, leave Guso uh, to come to uh, Katsina. Uh, so, you know, there's a bit of, we are so unsure and that's why we are keeping tabs and trying to to be here on standby just in case anything happens. But as it is, uh, they are still in Gosa. We don't know how long it's going to take them to finish up uh, the medical examination. We're not sure whether they're going to do the whole medical exami examination for all of them before bringing them here or they want to split it. My imagination is that they will want to finish all of the medical examination for them before they come to Katsina. Uh, so we, uh, we know that they may not be here in another uh, 30 or two hours, which was the previous information we had about two hours ago when I gave the update for the world. Well, do you have any information about the parents or guardians of the affected schoolboys? Are they also there in government house awaiting the arrival of their children? Or has any other arrangement been made for oh, the parents to also reunite uh, as soon as they arrive with their children? All right, I mean, I'm speaking to you currently from the government house, and uh, there are no parents here. As of yesterday, we were, when it broke out, when, I mean, the governor confirmed, uh, and then there were information here and there indicating that, you know, the parents will be here to receive the children. We thought that at some point uh, we would see parents, you know, or guardians or caretakers coming into the government house, but no, we've not seen any such thing. We also do not have any information regarding that. Uh, not so much. We're not hearing so much at this level uh, from the government house as well as uh, from authority. In fact, uh, we're all left by, you know, with journalists. Um, some journalists have had to go right just before I came on air because we got this uh, latest information. But we do know that in Kankara, for instance, uh, parents have been in the school, converged in the school, waiting for them. Uh, we will get more information, you know, today because we have our, our sources also on ground to let us know what the situation is in Kankara. But as you would imagine, I'm sure they are all excited and waiting and uh, no one will want this wait to be extended. Uh, they would rather want to be quickly reunited with their family as quickly as humanly possible, if I put it that way. Indeed, I'm sure the parents are so anxious. What is it about this medical test that cannot be done in Katsina? Is it a situation with the COVID-19 pandemic and that the peculiarity it's one of those mornings, <laughs> the peculiarities thereof, that they have to be tested in Guzo you know, negative, and then they are reunited with their parents. Is that the thinking here? 
Uh, well, we, I, I can't uh, certainly say it's just the COVID testing. I mean, these uh, students have been uh, with their captors. They've not had access to good food. They've not had access to good water. Uh, some of them, as you would imagine, even uh, Governor Aminu Bello Masalari confirmed that yesterday that some of them are weak already and tired, even though there is no uh, confirmation of any sick one. Uh, but you can imagine that, yes, they need to really go through some medical assessment to be sure that they are okay. Trauma, as you would imagine, would be there. They are, of course, they will be traumatized and other issues. But we're looking at it that they're just assessing their health, their well-being, uh, their state of mind. I hope and all of that. Uh, maybe within that context, uh, there's going to be COVID-19. But there's never been an indication to say they are testing them particularly. The examination, medical examination, is for COVID-19. No, it's you know the procedure. Since they've been in this kind of situation, they need to assess them and be sure that they are healthy and well enough. I hope to travel and you know reunite with their family because you know the governor said that they want to hand over these children you know in the best of themselves. So I, I, my thinking is that's all the, they're trying to get sorted. It, it, it's not uh, just COVID-19. Right. Uh, I, 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 do we have any reactions from the military because they too were part of this? And uh, do you know anything that we do not know here about the deal? You know the deal that got them out yesterday. We do not know anything because, uh, again, the government is not revealing so much in that regard. Uh, what he did say, what he said yesterday, it was that at some point, yes, they are going to tell us how they got to where they got to. Uh, we also do know that there's a conversation from uh, the governor of Zampara State, uh, Matawale, who is saying, uh, who gave um, an exclusive to one of the media houses of how he contributed to the release of these students without any payment of ransom. Uh, there's that conversation going on. Uh, we clearly don't know any other thing uh, until we get that information. We were expecting, again, you know that there was supposed to be the World Press Conference uh, that was supposed to happen yesterday, but that didn't happen. Those are the kind of information that we're expecting that we'll hear from the governor. Having said that, we are hoping that at some point we'll get all of this information, but no reaction from the military uh, at all. But we, we, before we came on air, again, in several conversations with several different people we were able to talk to uh, some of the guys involved in you know uh, surveillance uh, of the bushes and um, not so much came out from there again because you know he's not the, uh, it's not so much an authority to speak to the media but uh, we, we would just cross keep our fingers crossed uh, to get this information as soon as you know they release them we are hoping that yes more will come as you imagine this story is still developing there are different angles to it as you do know that we don't know uh, there are different aspects of it also so there is a security generally aspect of it. There's even the, the place where they were rescued. There's the forest, the boundary. There are a whole lot more that will need to be revealed in the coming days about this whole uh, situation. Amaka, the newspapers are reporting that the uh, boys are in Safi in Zamfara State. But you say they are in uh, Guso. Uh, I'd like you to clarify that. And then how far away is uh, uh, Guso or Safi from uh, uh, Katsina? And are we, do we know for certain that the boys will be brought to Katsina today and presented to the president, as has been reported? All right, again, that's what I said earlier on. Uh, we, we were told as at yesterday, yesterday that they were in Safi en route to uh, Katsina. But as at this morning, the latest information we have is the fact that they are still in Guso still undergoing medical examination before they come here. We don't know what time they're going to come into Casina. We hope that they're going to come into Casina. Uh, of course, the governor is here. The, the, we, we, the, my imagine, imagination is that whatever happens when they are done in Guso, they're going to still bring them here where the governor also will receive them. And if there are other uh, protocols to be observed, that will follow. Uh, we don't know certainly what time. Uh, um, Guso to Casina, Zampara to Casina, to Casina uh, if you, depending on the rules, that you follow actually uh, if you follow the GBI I think that's the the right uh, name it's about two hours um, but if you follow I can't recall the name of the other route we're having that conversation with uh, our one of our sources here it's about three hours so um, because in the morning
morning, when earlier around 5 a.m., when they, we got the first bit of information that they are already on their way, they gave us the estimate of about two hours uh, before all of this changed now to well, uh, they are still in good, so we're still undergoing the medical uh, um, medical examination, and they are not out of that place yet. So I can't certainly tell you when they will be in Katsina, but when they come to Katsina, we are hoping that yes, they should come to Katsina and that they will be in Katsina at some point. As soon as possible, I would imagine, because apart from being trotted out for political photo ops, the ultimate supplement to whatever therapy they're receiving is to be reunited with their parents or guardians and also help clarify the numbers. You'll recall that it was reported initially 333 boys kidnapped and then a report 17 boys escaped that left 316. But now, according to today's papers, I'm quoting this day, 344 were freed. So it also adds credence to claims that it was actually more than 333 boys that were kidnapped in the first case. Do we know any more about this? All right, let me take you back, uh, some step back. Um, you know, yes, th th there were a lot of conflicting figures. And again, you recall that we spoke to two, uh, three returned boys. And one of them particularly told us the figure that we use, which is 520 of them that were kidnapped. Now, the figures that the government released in terms of the state government, in terms of those who, uh, re who the boys that are released, are 344. Now, if you subtract that number from 520, which is you know what uh, the returned students told us, it will be left with about 176 or 174. So that begs the question, which is some of the, again, like I told you, there are still different angles to this story. That begs the question, uh, did they release all of them? Uh, is there a problem uh, uh, from, uh, you know, is there a, f a figure problem, so to speak? Are we expecting that some are still there or all of them? And if those are the numbers, so is there, is, is there a problem with the figures from the school register? Is there, there's something about the accuracy, the figures, the numbers that still needs to be verified. Uh, so, I mean, th th that's the background I wanted to bring to you because uh, if we say 520, uh, if you take the 344 out of that, 170 something are still missing. So if that isn't the case, does it mean that it's just 344 and that probably maybe the school are not aware of the number of people? Remember that this school is a school of over a thousand, uh, about a thousand students uh, that are there. So yes, again, all of these figures and clarity are the things that we need to process and dig out and then be sure what it is. But so far, you know, this is uh, the analysis that we can give you based on the number that we know speaking to the return child and based on the number that the government have released of those that have been released uh, there's still a bit of discrepancies to uh, be reconciled there all right speaking of that i i, I want to know has there been any platforms even meet with the parents uh, how many parents have they been able to identify now that they can say okay this is my son missing this is his detail so that they can match that with the students they have and also, has there been any platform on which they have psychosocial support for the parents? I mean, have they been able to, do we even have like, oh, two, three hundred parents now? Okay, my son is missing, is missing, and we can match them up with the numbers we have now. Has there been that interface? Uh, not yet, uh, not yet. When we were in Ankara two days ago, uh, we spoke to a few parents who brought say, uh, stuff like uh, the identity card of their children to say, oh, this is my child and this child is in this school, in this school and in this class, this is the age of the child. That's the much that we, we can say, you know, in terms of, well, yeah, this student indeed are in this school. There's been no platform, so to say, uh, you know, to say, to merge these numbers or to put the, both the, the face or the student uh, to the numbers we've not had any uh, such yet and then talking of psychosocial support th there is none that we are aware of we do know though that uh, the coalition of the uh, northern groups one of them was in in the station yesterday have been giving some support uh, to the parents and have also been in how many parents are the they parents. Been giving the support uh, that's this th i say how many parents i'm not sure of the figure uh, okay. of okay I'm not sure of the figures of how many parents that they've given uh, this, is, is such support to. Uh, but from when, when we went on ground, the parents that we saw, uh, we can tell you that none of them, in Kankara at least, have received any such uh, uh, so psychosocial support, unless it happened when we left Kankara, which is two days ago. But for now, we don't have any details, and we don't know any established platform. Again, unless just maybe after they come back, because again, you know, the thing with trauma is that both the children are traumatized, and the parents 
parents and siblings and caretakers are also vicariously traumatized. You know, so everyone in, that is directly involved in this would need some sort of therapy and I hope that there will be provision for, for that. For now there's no, that, that conversation, we've not had that conversation but th those are the kind of things that, you know, when we get uh, uh, time to meet with authorities that will be asking uh, what next? The, the what next is not just, you know, reconciling them and reuniting them with the family and you know, you know having them examined changing their clothing like the governor say and you know, feeding them that's just not it. There are other aspects of it, you know, even their psychological well-being as you would imagine and even their mental health as well. I mean, some of them are so traumatized that uh, the ones that we spoke to who returned, you know, know mentioned that they don't want to go back to school. Uh, Naim, for instance, when we talk to him, Naim is a you know, sickle cell warrior, as they are called. He says he wants to go to school because he wants to be a doctor, to be able to, you know, be able to take care of his other siblings who are also sickle cell warrior. So he wants to go back to school, but he says he doesn't want to be in any school where he's, he doesn't feel safe. He will never go back to Ankara. That's what he said. And when we talked to the other young man two days ago, he mentioned that he loves to go to school, but he won't want to go back to Kankara again. He won't want to go back to a boarding school. He won't want to go to any school that is away from his home. So all of those kind of, you know, uh, implications are there to deal with. And again, in Nigeria, in a country where we are already saying we have uh, 16 million out of school children, that's if you combine both the primary and secondary school, then there's a huge implication, you know, for this uh, singular incident that happened on the education how are we going to get these people back to school? How are we going to maintain uh, a country that needs, that education is crucial? So all of those aspects, I, I suppose, are intertwined in this whole uh, situation, in this whole incident. And like I said, bit by bit, we will be able to follow and unfold and see and unravel what next and what does what next concretely means and in practical terms for both the parents and the children and even the school and the community uh, by extension. All right, thank you so much for your time, uh, Maka, for your, you stay safe yourself in uh, Kassina there. Right, that's all on News Headlines. Take a short break. Now, when we return, we'll have uh, the trio. I mean, no, not the trio, really. Rose is a dream, Mike Wilson, and this one, Morua, Aaron Akirajala, and the list just goes on. For Africa Global Business, uh, COVID-19 and Sporting Activities, stay with us. All right, welcome back. Still, the morning show right here on the Rise News channel. Our dependable Rotsu Zodira is here Africa business, for Africa Business Update. But Rotsu are most excited because the boys are back this morning. And that's something to chat about. Good, good morning, uh, Rafai. Good morning, Tundu. And good morning, uh, Doctor. We begin, of course, uh, as a follow-up to yesterday's uh, public hearing here in uh, Lagos State on uh, real estate. So, of course, the Lagos State House of Assembly held a public hearing uh, where they were going to discuss the plans that they have for um, the real estate sector. So there were keynote speakers. Uh, there it is, yeah, there's, there's the flyer that they held, the Committee on Housing. So they're gonna be looking at essentially, remember we talked about the need to stream this online. Not everybody could make it to Alausa at 10 a.m. in the morning. So anyway, the, the Lagos State House of Assembly Twitter account gave us the uh, details that we needed. So take a look at the uh, series of tweets here. So welcome, they have a public hearing on, this is it, a bill for a law to regulate real estate transactions in Lagos State and other connected purposes. So we take a look at the next uh, set of tweets here. So the proposed bill intends to sanitize real estate transactions through the operation of, it. and here's the key, a database containing particulars of persons and organizations engaged in the business of real estate agency in Lagos State in order to monitor their activities and protect citizens against fraudulent real estate transactions. In addition, it plans to guarantee the protection of persons and organizations dealing in the real estate sector. Take a look at the next uh, set of tweets here where they talk about, where they continued along, along this line to ensure that they register with the state, obtain a permit, all right, a permit on registration before commencing operations, ensure that real estate transactions are transparent, gain market confidence. When you gain market confidence, you get more entrance into the market and are devoid of fraudulent uh, practitioners and all forms of, uh, of property 
property fraud. Um, we're also going to take a look at Mr. Uh, okay, yeah, this, okay, so this sector, I think we've got an image of Mr. Wasiu Sani. Yeah, there he is. Mr. Wasiu Sani is the Deputy Speaker uh, of the Lagos State House of Assembly. He delivered the keynote address, which was supposed to be from the uh, Honorable Mudashiro Obasa. He was going to deliver the keynote address, but he, Mr. Sani, who we're looking at right now, he delivered the uh, keynote address on his uh, behalf. So let's take a look at what, uh, what he said uh, here. So he says, the sector has been long yearning for benefiting beneficiary, beneficial regulatory and policy modernization. The danger in having unrecognized and often unqualified persons operating in the key areas of this sector, like facility management, property developers, valuers, agents, etc. And next to it can't be overestimated to say the least. Essentially, it's not only security on tidy. It portends many other grave strains like revenue leakage. That's the key there. Everybody should focus on that. <laughs> revenue leakage to the government, um, proliferation of substandard facilities, exploitation of several kinds of fraud, amongst others. More tweets uh, from Lagos State Government. I mean, well, that's the gist of it. So um, essentially, they want to be able to, I, I think we've got more tweets from them on this matter, but they, they essentially want to be able to regulate the real estate sector so that they can provide more transparency, and the database is key. We've, I mean, you, everybody here knows a story of where you go to buy land or something, and then somebody else turns up and ends up t taking the land. There's an issue of, of the need for a database in order to regulate the sector properly. But again, it, this, is, this, is a, this is a revenue, we'll call it what it is. It looks like a revenue drive, right? That's because the, the Lagos State government wants to be able to know exactly who is participating in the sector, they want to be able to get, you know, uh, tax it efficiently and generate revenue from it because there are a lot of transactions that fall to the cracks. Ghana utilized block, I mean, they're testing it, but I know in, in, in Accra also, you can use blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is a decentralized system where you've got several players putting in key amounts of data. You can unload real estate data onto a, block, onto a blockchain. It's open, transparent for everyone to see. So technology has to play a role in what the Lagos State government is trying to do. They talked a lot about what the bill is supposed to do, but they didn't go into how that's going to be done. So we'll see. I mean, we've been talking about databases and the NIN and SIM card registration and all these things. So you can see how the, data, the need for a database keys into each sector with regards to knowing you know, who is in, who is in play, what's being done, and then taxing it efficiently so well, they can get uh, revenue from there. Um, yes, go ahead. Doctor. Okay, yes, okay, go ahead. You have another story. Yeah, so MTN, if you look at a couple of uh, MTN executives here, the uh, outgoing CEO of uh, MTN, Mr. Fedi Muman, and then the, he's of course going to be the new chief risk officer uh, in March of 2021. And then you've got Carl uh, Toriola, who is the new MTN Nigeria CEO. He, come, he comes into uh, if, in effect on uh, March 20, 2021. They held a brief investor conference call um, yesterday, I believe, or the day before, where they spoke about this new um, order from the NCC, the Communications Commission, in order to get everyone ready registered using the national identification number linked, of course, to the SIM cards. And what they said was that it's going to take about six months. Now, of course, we, of course, reported yesterday, um, Arise News, had, we reported that the House of Reps, the National Assembly essentially said that, look, they need to extend this two-week uh, deadline to 10 weeks. So I think the National Assembly is saying we should extend this to the end of January as opposed to the two weeks. That the two weeks is just not enough time to register all the SIMs with the, the, the NIN numbers. So we've got different timelines here. MTN, who is a player in the sector, they're according to that conference call where the two executives spoke to investors and the public, they said it's going to take about six months. And I think one should align with the actual players in the sector who are doing what they can to register people. Of course, there have now been a lot of updates. If you already have a NIN number, you can either use a USSD to key in and link the two together. If you already have your NIN, you can go to the websites of the telcos and link them. By the way, that USSD comes with, I think, a 20 Naira or 10 Naira charge. So the, the telcos, for those who have NINs or NINs already, they are facilitating the linkage. If you don't have an NIN number, you still have to go. But the key here is the timeline. They're saying it's going to take a, a pretty long, longer time. Well, the position <laughs> of the uh, MTN is understandable. You know that we had also expressed concern that, you know, government was planning to uh, create panic, cause anxiety, cause confusion uh, during the festive period, giving a deadline of just uh, two weeks. So what MTN is saying, the outcome of that conference call, basically, is that it's not feasible uh, to match SIM cards with NIN uh, numbers within a space of two weeks. 
Uh, but would they take the consequential step? And I ask that question because uh, we were told that the decision uh, in this direction was taken at a meeting of stakeholders. I imagine that MTM was also at that meeting. So apparently they didn't make that presentation at that meeting, or they did, and they were ignored. Uh, but if that is not the case, now that they have had time to reflect further on it, I think they should uh, approach the NCC and the Ministry of Communications with this resolution to say, look, the best uh, frame, uh, time period within which we can deliver in this regard is six months. And I think that is a very reasonable demand. The uh, House of Representatives had asked for additional 10 weeks uh, plus two weeks. That would be uh, three months. But six months may well uh, definitely be uh, a better option. And MTN could liaise uh, with other telecom companies so that together they can make their presentation uh, to the NCC and the Ministry of Communications. And we hope uh, that the Ministry of Communications and its agency, the NCC, will have a listening ear in this regard. As for Lagos State, yes, yesterday uh, you made the point that this is a revenue drive, and uh, you've repeated your point again today, but I think we should look at the bigger picture. Uh, Lagos State has not said there won't be revenue involved. It's an executive bill. They said revenue that should come to government will come to government. But the bigger issues they are focusing on is, as you have pointed out, you know, having proper data, sanitizing real estate operations uh, in Lagos State. And in that wise, Section 2 of this proposed bill uh, talks about the establishment of a real estate regulatory authority. Now, Section 14 talks about the creation of a, of a real estate register. And it is to check, you know, to ensure professionalism. The concern is that there are all kinds of people parading themselves as property developers, real estate agents, and all kinds of persons involved in that business. So the objective is equity, professionalism, transparency. To the extent that those principles are useful, uh, we could say it's a noble idea. But the real estate regulatory authority is going to be an additional bureaucracy. Okay? It will have to be funded. I hope that the Lagos state has enough resources to be able to do that. And we can express the concern in line with what you said about revenue, uh, that this should not be another agency that will be used to harass people unnecessarily or to extort people unnecessarily. On that Twitter account, the uh, Lagos House of Assembly says uh, people can uh, send direct messages, you know, to uh, contribute further to the uh, discussions. But I hope that they will take the uh, more important step also of making that bill publicly available so that people can study, you know, clause by clause. The bill has 37 sections. So we can look at the sections 1 to 37 and be able to make uh, inputs as uh, the lawmakers begin to debate uh, that particular bill. Right, Rotus, I mean, you've said it all for me. For me, one of the biggest challenges here will be about land titles. We all know how very murky land titles are in Lagos, how very cumbersome the process is. And you've said it all. We can use blockchain to be able to aid the land title process. That's a principal thing in all of this conversation. But I don't think they are implementing it. And a lot of people, you see, I'll talk like I spoke yesterday. A lot of people are ready in this Nigeria to be able to help us use blockchain to be able to harmonize land titles. And the question should be, if you're having a regulatory agency, you want to regulate, you know, get monies and commissions and things like that, ensure there's, uh, there's, 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 there's transparency in transaction, that's very good. But the question is, what are you doing back for the real estate sector in the country. Because you can, you, can, you can say all the crazy things about these developers, but these developers, in many cases, have had to do the role of government. They provide infrastructure where government is not providing, because normally government is supposed to provide infrastructure in those areas. So the question has always been for me, what is the government to doing in return? Because it's a symbiotic relationship. If you say you, can, you, you want to make some revenue from this sector, what would you use the revenue to do back for the sector? I'm happy about the fact that they're going to stop fraudulent activities, but is that part of that revenue? Is it going to help to even bring in the technological architecture like blockchain you talked about to be able to bring about a vibrant database, you know, for land titles? Let's even start from there. Have you ever tried going to the land, land registry in Alausa in, in, in Lagos? It's a nightmare. So let's even start from there. Let's even start for ratification of governor's consent and things like that. 
Yes, but it's beyond that. As in, you're talking about symbiosis. I don't think that's been contemplated at all. Like you said, Rotus, it's about revenue. So it's about taking and not giving. And there was a loophole that was identified there, that there are no sanctions for failure to register but there are sanctions applicable to those who register. So what is the incentive for you to actually register? So it actually might not work as is envisaged. It's the same thing. And concerning MT and Rotu, you remember I kept on asking the question that was this the best idea in the room for that meeting that day? It is obvious that MT and didn't get a chance to say their mind. Thanks a lot, Rotus, for your time. You. All right, we'll move on to business update. Michael Wilson joins us now from London. <laughs> Yes, good morning. Uh, Asia, um, a bit soft, actually, this morning after the Bank of Japan uh, extended some help towards businesses which aren't doing very well. That kind of dark mood really spread across most of Asia and will certainly head into uh, Europe as it begins to open uh, in a few minutes' time. I have a name for you which is going to be very important over the next few months. This is President Joe-elect Biden's US trade representative. She's called Catherine Tai, T-A-I. Uh, and... Uh, a crucial part of her job will be to negotiate with China. She's a, a Mandarin speaker. She's an expert on China. Um, she doesn't particularly uh, like carrying tough lines. She prefers to work prefers to work by consensus. So I'm told. But she will carry on uh, a tough line uh, with China. She's worked with the European Union, Mexico, and Japan at the World Trade Organization. And speaking of the WTO, here's another one for you that. Um, you, you know Ngozi Onkonjo Ewealo very well, of course. I'm sure you. I've interviewed her. I'm sure you have too. Uh, she, the, the 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 U.S. has decided or said, and this is the outgoing U.S. administration that it needs a new process to find a director general of the WTO. Now, that's a completely unprecedented move. Trump, uh, Trump's trade chief, we talked about him yesterday, Robert Lighthizer, who's been going around giving a lot of interviews, saying that uh, the WTO needs somebody who has, as he puts it, someone with real experience in trade. They haven't reached a consensus um, about her, but that will be something that probably Joe Biden uh, will need to address uh, in a few weeks' time. Also, the United States is set to add uh, dozens of Chinese companies to its blacklist, um, including the, the, the country's top um, uh, chip maker, SMIC. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's a continuation, basically, of uh, Trump's be tough on, on China. Designations by the Commerce Department are expected to name some Chinese um, companies that Washington says may have ties to the Chinese military. So it goes on and on. Um, that said, though, the US markets had a decent day yesterday, another set of records for the S&P 500 and also for the NASDAQ um, after that poor weekly uh, claims number. But the reason that the markets did quite well is they feel as though that poor number will be pushing lawmakers in the United States to get this stimulus act together. Um, and uh, it's not going to be a lot. I mean, as looking at the figures yesterday, maybe people getting checks of between six and seven hundred dollars. It's better than nothing, but nowhere near the twelve hundred dollars that was originally mooted for this to try to um, get over the, the, the consumer effects of the virus. And it does not include, and I think this is probably just as important, it doesn't include any money for the setup of what's going to be an incredibly difficult organisation to actually vaccinate the whole of the uh, continent of the United, or the co population rather, of, of the United States and its dependencies, of course. Um, right, so UK and EU trade goes on. We're getting different talks from, uh, as we do at the moment, pessimism of Michael Gove, bit of optimism from Michel Barnier, UK chief negotiator, as well as our Prime Minister Boris Johnson saying things are not going very well. A um, little hard to square in what the markets have been pricing. The markets are pricing in that there'll be some sort of deal. Um, the talks appear to be stuck on some elements of the, the level playing field, namely around the EU's <clears throat> $750 billion <clears throat> excuse me, economic recovery plan. <clears throat> as well as the thorny issue fisheries, which we've talked about um, before. Uh, the Prime Minister has, been, has gone on record as saying that he doesn't think that the EU stance on fishing uh, is reasonable. And uh, <clears throat> this suggests to me 
and to many other observers as well, that this Sunday deadline may slip again. Who knows? Um, but it's, it seems as though this sort of choreographed tap dance is still uh, going on at the moment. Both sides can therefore claim, presumably, when they eventually do reach some sort of agreement, which I think they will, won't necessarily be very good, both sides can claim that they went to the very end to extract every last concession, because that's what big negotiations do. But we'll see. Retail sales disappointing, as expected. Um, the first... Uh, move into uh, reverse of retail sales in November, down 3.8%. Um, and we, we wait to see what happens as far as uh, Christmas is concerned. Um, now, what can I tell you about oil? Oh, this is, I think you'll quite like this. So the w, WTI, um, West, West Texas Intermediate, set its sights on 50, according to the markets this morning. Uh, it could reach a bit of a resistance level just above $49, but you never know. That, and that would, be, that would be very good for countries like yours that depend upon um, oil for a lot of its revenues, if not the majority of its revenues. Uh, and gold is pushing $1,900. Um, it's, it's been a good week for it, actually, given that the Fed decided to do very little. So that's sort of pushed people into the safety first uh, of gold. And the Fed saying it had no intention, as expected, of raising interest rates over the near or indeed distant future. That's your, okay. that's your global view. Good morning. Okay, Michael. Uh, you, you kept on talking about uh, uh, maybe a coordinated tap dance between the EU and Britain. Pretty much to me, Michael, it looks like a tap wear. It's not even a tap dance. It's not a friendly dance, I should say. It's like a Brazilian hard-on cap wear. But I want to talk about the, the unemployment figures that came out of America, the worst in three months, while the Democrats and the Republicans have tried to do a deal as regards to sort of like a bailout of uh, 900 billion to 1 billion, uh, 1 trillion US dollars. Uh, what is happening in America? The job figures are not looking good at all. Well, the, the, the package won't be that big. As I said, it's, it, it, I think the total package would be lucky to get to um, 900 billion. I think we're talking about, as far as money in pockets is concerned, between six and seven hundred dollars in each person's pocket. So what, what, what's happening is they have been unable to agree about this. But it may just be that those disappointing jobs figures and indeed, which don't raise any great hopes for what's for the Christmas period, etc. And the continuing lockdowns in the United States may be at last dragging politicians, as it, as it were, feet to the fire, uh, in, in, in other words, so that they can actually say, we are doing something, we are going to get to a final figure for this negotiation. But as you rightly say, it's been it's been going on for a long, long time. I have no, I have no idea why. As I've said to you all along, if I were a politician, I'd be going to my constituents and say, this is what I did for you. I pushed for the deal. I mean, I don't understand why politicians don't do that. What else are they supposed to do? We elect them to do what they want, what we want them to do. And and we want them, do we not, to get the economy of the United States going? What's, what's the problem? I don't see it at all. Well, Michael, um, whatever happens with the Brexit uh, trade talks, maybe you shouldn't worry. After all, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has said that once the UK takes control of its uh, you know, uh, fishing uh, waters and all of that, then the British will be eating fish for breakfast, lunch and dinner. You know, that, that sounds like something to look forward to. <laughs> but I'm joking anyway. Uh, maybe, maybe. Financial, Times, <laughs> Financial Times is reporting that the EU is uh, rushing to sign an investment deal uh, with uh, China to grant uh, the EU wider access to the Chinese market. And that there are very strong indications that they will be able to see that deal. Um, do we have anything about the details? And would that have any effect on you know, the uh, trade relations with Europe, with UK and Europe. Yeah, well, I, I don't think it'll affect the trade relations between the UK and Europe because Europe will have to go its own way and decides what it wants to do. I think if you want a personal opinion about it, I think if you're trading with China, you need to be very careful about the small print because the EU is doing it for, the, for obviously both sides are doing it completely for themselves. But China's view of the world, I would suggest, is very, very different from the EU. The EU is a is, is an experiment. It's a project which can't go backwards. But it, it's 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 getting weak around the edges. There is we've seen that the, there are doubts about the stimulus plan within the EU. As far as China is concerned, all we hear from China is success and an advancement. Their their Belt and Road uh, scheme, which is, doesn't doesn't go along um, political cycles. This is an era of of Chinese expansion. It is happening. If I were the EU and I were those negotiators, I'd be reading that small print very very carefully indeed. 
need. I don't want to impugn China, but you, you know, Doctor, as well as I do, that when somebody, like somebody who's not very friendly towards you, starts lending you money and then says, and then you say, I can't pay it back, and they say, well, don't worry about that. We'll just, we'll just take control of your business. That's, that's what happens. That's what happens in, in real life. The EU needs to be very, very careful about what it's dealing with, I would suggest. Well, thank you, Michael. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, let, let's, let's speak to this one this morning about uh, COVID-19. Emmanuel Macron, the list goes on. Well, what are we hearing this morning, this one? The oh, good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Dr. Abbasi. And good morning, Tundu. Good morning. Indeed, the 42-year-old French president tested positive um, yesterday. And as a result, we have quite a number of um, EU leaders who are now scrambling to get tested and have gone into isolation. But I'll bring you uh, a bit more detail after we look at the global numbers, shall we? Uh, so this morning, we have 74.9 million cases globally. Uh, we have eating to a 75 million mark, and of course, 1.6 million deaths so far. Uh, we are seeing these numbers coming in from Europe, the Americas, and elsewhere. There seems to be a spike. We'll be talking about second wave uh, a bit later. And back to that uh, update um, Rufai was asking about. Yes, indeed, Emmanuel Macron uh, testing positive. You would recall that last week and in recent days he had been attending events, including the European Council Summit in Brussels, the OECD's 60th anniversary, and he has, in fact, received several leaders at the Elysee Palace this week. His wife, Bridget, uh, will also be self-isolating, but uh, shows no symptoms. We are told that the president has um, mild symptoms and he's self-isolating and would continue working. Uh, away from that, in a bid to build vaccine confidence among skeptical Americans, Vice President Mike Pence will this morning be taking his own Pfizer vaccine jab on live television uh, in the White House. And uh, he will be the highest ranking Trump administration official to be getting a vaccine. He will be joined by his wife, uh, Karen Pence, as well as the Surgeon General of America, Dr. Jerome Adams. Now, the Surgeon General hopes that uh, his own jab on live television will increase confidence amongst African Americans we know that the minority groups are very skeptical about this for a very good reason. Uh, it has happened in the past, and they are hoping this will not repeat itself. Um, meanwhile, there's been a second allergic reaction to the Pfizer BioNTech uh, jab, vaccine jab in Alaska. Another health worker, but in the same hospital um, that we saw earlier. This time around, it's a male uh, nurse who um, experience eye puffiness, lightheadedness, and um, scratchy throat. Uh, this happened 10 minutes after he got injected with the vaccine, but we are told that he was treated and felt completely back to normal within an hour and was released. Pfizer had 44,000 people in trials. They did not see any major reaction to um, the vaccine. And recall that it also did not include those with allergic reactions to the trial. So it's not unusual to see this reaction in mass population, but they say they are monitoring. They will get further details from the authorities in America. The American authorities also say they are also monitoring the situation. Nothing life-threatening, but they will continue to monitor. And I think that for anybody who has taken vaccines, um, there are reactions to vaccinations. Some are just lucky not to get them as bad as others. Uh, to Europe in general, where the first inoculation against the coronavirus will begin across the block on December 27th, 28th, and 29th. And that's according to the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen. She tweeted yesterday. Um, she said that you know, the, country, the continent had been had as hit, and they stand together as a people, and they will do this together. And I, and I found that very heartwarming and interesting that they will be doing this together at the same time. It makes a lot of sense. But the rollout will depend on the um, health regulatory agency in Europe, which is the EMA. It is set to deliberate, deliberate on, the appro on approving the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine on Monday. And to Russia, 
where the 68-year-old President Vladimir Putin says he's a law-abiding citizen and so he will not take the vaccine jab yet because it has not been authorized for those above 60. So uh, President uh, Putin hasn't, take this, hasn't taken Sputnik 5. Uh, now, Sputnik 5 was unlike its Western counterpart, has received a lot of skepticism. And that's because it, it went into mass inoculation even before uh, phase three trials began. Uh, President Putin also yesterday at that press conference uh, said that they are facing uh, production challenges. He says his government is considering reducing doses from one to two in order to get the vaccine quickly to more people. Again. 200,000 Russians have been inoculated as of December 14th. And finally, to Nigeria, I talked about the second wave. The PTF officially announced yesterday that we are in the second wave. It comes on a day Nigeria recorded 1,145 new cases, the highest ever infection recorded in one day since record keeping commenced in March. And just to add that another governor in Nigeria has tested positive, the governor of Plateau State, Governor Lalang of Plateau. But I don't know what the plan is here. I, I, for me, the strategy in Nigeria seems to be based on common sense. I think they, they, they believe that everybody should have common sense and do the right thing. Well, um, I don't know. Tundo, you want to go first? Well, I'm glad, After Tundo. I'm glad you, you said something because I was going to throw some shade about the lack of common sense. But I will refrain from that. <laughs> it's really unfortunate about what is happening in this world where somebody like Mike Pence, who is a strong evangelical Christian, even he knows that he's going to have to take this vaccine publicly along with his wife, um, Karen, because he has heard the kind of tripe a lot of people are coming out with. We discussed this yesterday, OJ's story about lo shooting Lucifer into people's veins. Or what, what was that woman on about? So it's, even somebody like Mike Pence, is having to address this. And I think it should really be commended for doing so. This, for me, has really impressed me. You'll recall that Donald Trump placed him in charge of America's COVID-19 response, and he's really stepped up to the plate. So kudos to Mike Pence for doing that. He's going to save a lot of lives because there are a lot of people who look to him as an example because he's as conservative as conservative gets. So that's great. As for poor uh, Emmanuel Macron and the other um, European leaders who have high isolate. It's a constant reminder, all these high-profile cases, of the difficulties with COVID-19 and how ultra-cautious we all have to be. We all, you're here reporting these numbers. We're listening to you. But it must not go in one ear and out the other. We are in the second wave. And, you know, history has always been extremely useful because history is the best predictor for the future. If we go back to the um, Spanish flu of 1918, the second wave was more deadly than the first. Every single precaution must be taken by every single one of us. Indeed. Well, on Nigeria, quickly, you know, we had expressed concern. Even only yesterday, we were saying that the numbers could reach uh, about 2,000, either in January or sometime in uh, February. And it's good to see the presidential task force confirming uh, that the second wave is already here. Now, uh, the uh, presidential task force was recommending yesterday people pay more attention to non-pharmaceutical uh, inter interventions, use of face masks, uh, basic hygiene, washing of hands, social distancing, as we've been told. Uh, but the question I will raise is that, look, would Nigeria be ready uh, to go into a second lockdown? There's a story in the papers today saying that the organized private sector uh, is opposing that idea. But what we've seen in other parts of the world is that as the numbers you know, go up, uh, governments, the authorities, uh, you know, lock down the uh, places where the uh, prevalence is uh, going up. Are we willing and ready to do that in Nigeria? Because the insistence on people taking responsibility for their own lives doesn't seem to be working here. And there are no penalties, you know, for breaking the rule. You see parties, there have been more parties, you know, in the last uh, uh, two months or so than we've ever had you know, maybe the whole of uh, 2019. It's as if people now see the opportunity to just be partying all over the place. The churches are filled to the brim. This same presidential task force told us that, you know, uh, churches and mosques are the ones uh, disregarding. So I think government should perhaps apply the brakes while even it tries to seek a balance 
between managing the economy in the time of COVID-19 and also making sure that people do not commit suicide. Now, in Niger State, Niger State has shut down schools from today. Uh, from Monday, uh, the government of Niger State says people should, uh, civil servants should stay at home and not come to work. In Ebony, schools have also been shut down. In Lagos, Lagos announced that today all schools should be uh, shut down. Uh, look, the states, more states need to take very drastic measures. Maybe shut down local governments or shut down the entire state so that, you know, we, we all can uh, survive. I don't know. It's up to the states uh, to do what they want. As for Mike Pence, yes, that's what you call uh, leadership by example. Some other leaders who did not want to uh, take the vaccine, uh, they gave the excuse that, well, you know, there is an order uh, of uh, inoculation first with the health workers and then uh, the elderly, the vulnerable and all that. But these leaders coming forward uh, to take the vaccine, they're showing that, look, this is something that is really very important and that they too are providing uh, leadership in that regard. It will build confidence. Before now, President Obama, President Bush had also said that they would take the vaccine. Um, um, President-elect Joe Biden has also disclosed that uh, he's likely to take the vaccine also publicly uh, next week. So that will help to add, build confidence, address the challenge of vaccine hesitancy, yeah. particularly in the United States. You, you, ra you raised a point about uh, vaccine reaction. Yeah. Now, I think it's very important. And that vaccine reaction is probably also responsible for the reason why a number of people are, you know, hesitant. Yeah. But the bigger problem that I see is that in the U.S., they have a law called the PrEP Act, the PrEP Act of 2005, it will expire in 2024. What does that law say? That law says that if anything goes wrong, if you take any vaccine or any uh, kind of uh, vaccine specifically, mm -hmm. then you cannot sue the company that manufactured the vaccine. Mm -hmm. They have that immunity, which is very rare in healthcare. Two, you cannot sue government. Government has sovereign immunity. Mm -hmm. And three, if your employer says that you must take a vaccine as a condition of employment, you cannot take your employer to court. Except, you know, you ask for exemption under the Civil Rights Act. Maybe you plead that uh, your religious belief will not allow you to take it. Then, of course, the employer reserves the right uh, not to uh, employ you. But with regard to uh, COVID-19, so if you have any side effect, you are on your own, mm -hmm. basically. I hope that, you know, there will be a conversation around that so that people can be compensated. And people who are skeptical, like Tuntun here, can class, be encouraged class to take the vaccine. I, I mean, I mean, it has to be said, if I can chip this in real quickly before we go on a quick break, uh, it has to be said, while those laws were put in place, it just shows the very long lobbying history America has on the big farmers and how they've been able to protect themselves. Because, you see, there are lots of people that are against vaccines in America. They wouldn't take vaccines. They don't even have the normal vaccine for their children. But concerning Nigeria, I just hope we learn. We've all treated this as a joke in this country. It was on this same TV station that a governor that just recovered from COVID that had a campaign for his election, we told him about social distancing, and this was his reply. He said, you know, the people love me, and you can't really push the people away from me. And he had just recovered from COVID. That's an indication that if we want to fight this war, the political class and the leadership do what is right in this country. But, Let's but all this do what is, is right. I agree with you, Rufa, and this is my issue with Boss Mustafa's um, presidential task force. Mm -hmm. They make such a huge fuss about the lapses of religious organizations, but now about political rallies that happened in this oh, country. They had we all saw it. They, yes, had they don't talk about that. It's churches and mosques that you know are the cause of the problem, yeah, really. Yeah. All right. so that doesn't for name. anyone who is not looking at that. For every country that is experiencing the second wave, it has been worse than the first wave. Okay. So yes. we need to get our acts together. Yes. I, I just so my dear. Love you to be some peace, but we need to go to Aaron now. This okay. one I really appreciate. Right. Thank you Thanks, so much. Guys. For it.